Thank you for those excellent songs. Turn, if you will, everybody, to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. I want to talk tonight about Joseph resisting temptation. Joseph was 17 years of age. His brothers hated him because he was his daddy's favorite. And he had the special coat that his father had given him. None of those other brothers had. And he had these dreams of greatness, these dreams that his brothers would bow down before him one day. In fact, that his mother and father even would bow down before him. Well, they weren't about to hear that. They weren't about to believe that. They couldn't imagine themselves bowing down to, uh, to Joseph. Well, they went off to uh, shepherd the flock of, of Jacob. And Jacob asked Joseph to go and check on them and check on the flock and bring word back. So he goes to this city. They're not there. They've gone on to another city. And so he goes there, and it's at the city of Dothan. And he sees them. He finds them, and he, he starts heading towards them, and they see him coming. And they start to conspire. Oh, here comes the dreamer. And they decide what, what let's do is let's kill him. And let's take his coat and everything. And let's go tell our father that he was killed by a wild beast. Well, one of the brothers said, now wait a minute. Let's not shed his blood. Let's just throw him in this dry hole over here. Like, we're going to leave him to die. He was actually intending to come back and to save him later. So they went ahead and threw him in that pit. And then another one of the brothers, as they were sitting there eating, looked up and they saw, he, he saw these uh, Ishmaelite traders that were coming on the caravan route and thought, you know what, wouldn't it be better, instead of killing our brother, that we just sell him to these traders and get rid of him. It'll be like he's dead. We won't have him in our life anymore, and we'll just tell our father that he's dead. And uh, that was the plan. Great plan. And so they sell him to these Ishmaelite traders for a very low price, uh, 20 pieces of silver, and uh, now they're rid of him. And so he is taken. Imagine, you're 17 years of age. Some of y'all in here are younger than 17. Most of us are quite a bit older than 17. I don't know if anybody in here is 17. But 17 years of age. I mean, you've got the rest of your life in front of you, and you're taken from everything you know and taken to this foreign country. Imagine that. That would be terrifying. And the temptations would be very unique now because you don't have mom and daddy there. And you can kind of get away with more and all that. Some of y'all will know that one day, maybe when you leave home and you go off to college or something like that, that now it's different. And so that's when the real test of your character might, might come out. Was I just obeying God because it was kind of enforced upon me in mom and dad's house? Or is this something that is internal, right? So Joseph proved himself to be a man of integrity and of character, and his faith was from within and not from without. So here he is, he's in Egypt. These Ishmaelite traders turn a nice profit, I'm sure, in selling Joseph to a man who worked for Pharaoh. And the man's name was Potiphar. So Potiphar is an officer for Pharaoh, and he is the head of the bodyguard. That's how the New American Standard renders it. And from what I've read, he was basically uh, like the chief of the executioners. Yeah! Imagine going to work for a man like that who works for Pharaoh. He's the chief of the executioners. This is wonderful. So here Joseph is. He's going he's to make the best of the situation, but the Lord blesses him. And he works for Potiphar. He just gets to work, and, and he has integrity, and, and uh, he just works diligently. And God blesses everything that Joseph does. And Potiphar notices, wow, look at all this success here. Well, I can just turn everything over to Joseph. Sure, he's a young man, but he's so capable. And so he doesn't have to worry about anything in the managing of his entire household. Joseph is in charge of the whole thing. 
And things went, you know, pretty well for however long until Potiphar's wife started really causing problems. And these problems were temptations. And so what we're going to study about is how Joseph dealt with these temptations and how he overcame them. He didn't give in to these temptations a single time, and it's a case study in how to resist temptation. And so what we're going to do is, this is kind of just a, you know, a study. We're just going to kind of go through the text and pull out the points as we go along, okay? And so we're going to see three things Joseph did. First of all, he connected with his goals, okay? This is verses 6 through 9. At the second half of verse 6, it says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. And she said, lie with me. So Joseph is a hunk. I mean, he is handsome in form and appearance. He just, he was a good looking young man. And Potiphar's wife really liked his looks. That's the indication here. That's the connection. It mentions he was good looking, and then the next thing is she looked with desire on him. Now, I'm sure it didn't hurt that he was Mr. Successful, uh, that, that he was Mr. Responsible, and I'm sure he was a nice, well-mannered young man, and all of that probably added to it. But what it mentions here is he was good looking, and she lusted after him. Do women have lust problems too sometimes? Sure. Sometimes we men think women don't understand. Women never lust. Oh, some women can lust. It may not be as prominent among women, for sure. But here we see Potiphar, and she's lusting after Joseph. Now, this is just a side point that I want us to think about. Lust always leads to sin. All lust leads to sin. James 1, 14 and 15, each man is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own lust or desire. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So it all starts with our own lust. It all leads to sin. Okay. However, lust that is of a sensual nature is inherently sinful. It is always sinful. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27 and 28? You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. All the Pharisees were concerned about is, well, as long as we don't commit the actual sin over there, we're okay to do all the other stuff that leads up to it. Jesus says, you've got it wrong. You've got it wrong. If you are looking at a woman with lust for her, with this attitude of, I sure would like to lie with that person, I'd like to be with that person, you're already committing a sin that is just as grievous as the act of adultery. Because sin is sin, is sin, right? So that's the point Jesus is making. So we have to take lust very seriously. We don't take it very seriously. We have to be cautious about how much we appreciate how good looking somebody is. I mean, it's one thing to notice, okay, somebody is attractive, that that person is attractive. That's, that's okay. But when you cross the line where now you're really interested in the way they look, now you're lusting. If they cross that line a little too far, you're lusting. Through the years, it's been amazing to me to hear how married people talk about people of the opposite gender when their spouse is not around. Oh, she's so hot. Or women. Oh, he's so fine. We'll talk about some man over there. That is not proper. And I believe that that could be an indication that your heart is lustful. That our heart, if we ever do that, is lustful. So let's be very careful. How much we appreciate the good looks of, of somebody else. And, uh, and so forth. Okay? So she was lusting after, after Joseph. And then I want to read now verses 8 and 9. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has not withheld anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? He can't even fathom how he could do that. 
this great wickedness that she's trying to get him to do. And so what he's doing here is he's explaining to her the reason. And he basically gives two reasons. Number one, Potiphar is trusting me. And number two, I don't want to sin against God. We see there a physical motivation and a spiritual motivation. The, the, the physical consequences and the spiritual consequences were on his mind. And he was thinking about both of those things right in this moment of temptation. And it would be a sin against God. Do you remember in Psalm 51, in verse 4, David is praying a prayer of repentance because he has committed adultery with Bathsheba. And he has murdered her husband, Uriah, to cover up the fact that he got her pregnant. And he's praying a prayer of repentance in the 51st Psalm. And in verse 4, he says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, wait a minute. Did he not also sin against Bathsheba? Did he not also sin against Uriah, whom he murdered? Did he not also sin against his own body? 1 Corinthians 6, 18, yes, he did. But David says, against you, you only have I sinned. What he means there is, ultimately, the one that I'm really sinning against is not Bathsheba, it's not Uriah, it's not myself, ultimately it's against you. Every sin, ultimately, is a slap in the face of the Almighty God. It is trampling the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. It is an insult and an offense, a personal offense to God. Now, think about that. We, we may not think of it as personal. It's personal. Sin grieves the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is sad when we sin, and God is hurt when we do that, and He is angry when we do that. So Joseph is connecting with all this in this moment of temptation. What can we learn from this? Well, a couple of things. First of all, connect with your goals, your spiritual goals, in the crucial moment of temptation. To stop and think about, what do I really want to accomplish here? If I do this temporary thing, it will be fun in the moment, maybe. But I'm going to be losing my influence. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be losing my relationship with God, and if I die this way, I'll go to hell. We have to think about what are the consequences and connect with the goals. Our goal is to shine the light of Christ now and to be in God's eternal light forever. That's our goal, and we have to remember that, to shine Christ's light now and to dwell in God's light eternally. When you're in the midst of temptation, stop. Think about that. Say it out loud. Pray about it. That's that's the very moment when we're the least logical and the least rational. We're not thinking rationally. But you have to stop and do what Joseph did and think rationally. In, uh, in the book Change Anything, this incredible book that is, uh, has wild research just from all sorts of sources, it's insane, to, to talk about how is it that people can change any behavior. And there are, there are six sources of influence. It's just incredible. But they do this experiment with these children, these young children. I don't remember the exact age. But they take these young children and, and they give them different tasks where they can earn money pretty easily. They earn 40 bucks if they just do a few simple tasks. Now, some of you young ones, I, I see the eyes, yeah, $40. You know, Ty told me the other day, a quarter, he said, a quarter to me uh, a quarter to you is like $300 to me. That's what he said. That was when I was asking him to give me a quarter of his. Uh, this is like $300. So to kids, money is totally different than it is to us. So here are these young kids that are able to earn $40. And then they are given the opportunity to either waste all this money on very expensive snacks that are priced like 10 times higher than retail, and the kids know that because they are told these are priced way too highly. All right? So they're either going to waste all their money or a lot of their money, or they are going to save their money. So they split the kids into two different groups, and one group was encouraged and enticed by these snacks, and most of those kids wasted their money. The other group was simply encouraged, initially was encouraged, 
I want you to think about when this experiment is over and you have this $40 on the other side, what would you like to spend this $40 on? Now, kids, if your brain just started going right there, if you had $40, cold cash, ooh, think of the Legos you could buy. Oh, whatever it is, you know? And so these kids just started getting excited about that. So whenever they were confronted with the temptation to buy all this overly priced candy, most of those kids saved most of their money. Okay, And so it simply makes the point that when you connect with your goals in the moment of temptation, it gives you a lot of leverage. And we see jo Joseph doing that very thing here. It's pretty amazing. Another thing we can learn from Joseph is turn your accomplices into friends. Uh, try to turn accomplices into friends. Now, so here, here he is explaining this to Potiphar's wife, why he can't give in to this sin. He wasn't just trying to help her understand. He was trying to get her to actually agree with him. Because if she stopped tempting him, his world would be a lot better. His life would be a whole lot easier. If your friends are trying to get you to sin, you know what you call those friends? Those are accomplices. They are not your friends. And so what you need to do is have a frank conversation with them like Joseph does with Potiphar's wife here and just say, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Here's how I need your help. I need you to actually move in the same direction as me. If they won't agree to that, then 1 Corinthians 10, 33, evil company corrupts good morals. We need to get some new friends, right? So we see Joseph making that effort. He wasn't successful there, but he tried. But the big point is that he connected with his goals. Well, now let's go to verse 10 and see the second thing that Joseph did. All right? Verse 10, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. So she just persists in tempting him on a daily basis basis, but he avoided her presence as much as possible. And that's the second, that is the second thing we're learning here, is he avoided her presence as much as possible. You know, it might be easy to overcome a temptation once, but when it's presented over and over and over again, it gets harder and harder to overcome. And I told the adult class this morning, the auditorium class, that the average person can only say no seven times before they finally give in. And uh, that's the case. I want you to imagine that you've decided to quit eating all sugar and, and all dessert. And you come home to find out that your spouse or your parents have bought just a huge box full of your favorite candy bar. And they're right there in the pantry. You see them every single day. Well, at first, you know what? It's going to be pretty easy, isn't it? Because, hey, I'm committed. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to give in. But after a few days, you just keep seeing that. Eventually, you know what might happen? You just might have a feeding frenzy on your favorite candy bar. That's the manner of sin. We're strong at first, but we continue having that temptation over and over, and we give in. Yet here Joseph is. He continues having the same temptation day after day, day after day, day after day, and he doesn't grow any weaker. He continued to resist. And that's the ultimate test of you know our faithfulness is will we continue and will we persevere he refused to even be with her not only to lie with her but he also refused to even be with her why because he didn't want to put himself in harm's way he didn't want to put himself in a tempting situation he didn't want to make it harder sometimes we make it harder on ourselves by the things that we surround ourselves with. We, we already have a, enough sources of influence fighting against us all the time. We're outnumbered. We don't need to make it harder by choosing to have filthy movies and, and to surround ourselves with people who have filthy mouths and so on and so forth. We need to surround ourselves with things that are going to help us. And so let's talk now about what we can learn uh, from Joseph here. Repeatedly overcoming temptation should make us stronger each time, not weaker. Now, I want you to think about that. I didn't just make that up. In James chapter 1, 
James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Endurance. And let endurance have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Perfect there means like mature. So, whenever we are tempted, whenever we endure trials, that should produce in us endurance. It should be the case that we overcome this temptation and we say, you know what? I feel a little bit more confident now. Look at what I just did. Well, look at what God just helped me to do. I can do that again. That wasn't too bad. And then the next time that temptation comes down the pike, we do a little better and we tell ourselves, hey, you know what? That was even easier than the first time. And every time we get stronger and stronger and stronger until eventually it's not actually a temptation for us. That should be what happens. That's what Scripture teaches should happen. And I think that's what was happening with, with Joseph. But uh, that's not what happens with many of us. We become weaker until we cave. The second thing uh, that we can learn here is to avoid the very presence of temptation as much as possible. I kind of already talked about that. But I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 7. Hold your place here in Genesis 39, but turn, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 7. In this chapter, the, the writer is speaking to his son and encouraging him how to avoid harlots. And I want to read a few extra verses than just verse 25, but look at verse 6, starting. For at the window of my house I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner, her being a prostitute, and he takes the way to her house. There's his first mistake. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. And behold, a woman comes to meet him dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. And it goes on to tell of how she seduces him and gets him to sin. And now look in verse 24. Now therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Verse 25, this is the key verse. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. Don't let your heart turn astray and don't stray into her paths. Stay away from her paths. Oh, well, you know what? I'm not going to I'm not going to do anything. I can go down this path. It'll be just fine. Do not stray into her paths. Take a different path. Stay far away from the temptation. If lust is a temptation for you, or for anybody in here, it might be that going to Walmart in the middle of a hot summer day is one of the worst things you can do. Because people walk around in there dressed very immodestly. Or going to the beach in the middle of the summer. Terrible idea. You want to surround yourself, guys, with constant temptation? Just go to the beach in the middle of the summer. That is foolish. It is foolish. Or having an unfiltered internet, if internet pornography is your problem. Who do we think we are? We have to learn not to trust ourselves. And Joseph wasn't trusting himself to, hey, I can put myself right in that situation, I'll be just fine. We're arrogant. When we trust ourselves, I can have that and I won't give in to the sin. No, you can't. And Scripture teaches that you have to avoid the very path that leads by the house of the harlot. So he avoided her presence as much as possible. Third point. This is going to be a short lesson. He took extreme measures. All right, so verses 11 and 12, we're back now in Genesis chapter 39. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. So he's all alone. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. Notice that in this occasion, she says the same thing, lie with me. But this time, he doesn't stop to explain why he can't lie with her. This is not the situation where there's going to be any discussion going on. This is not the time where there needs to be a debate going on. 
or reasoning going on. This is not an occasion where Joseph could just ignore her. She's holding his garment. He can't just go on about his business. He's got to get out of her presence bodily. And he's got to do it promptly. When temptation is urgent, we have to respond in an urgent manner. Some temptation isn't urgent. It's kind of over there and, and you, you might bring yourself to it. But sometimes it just hits you point blank. Has that ever happened? Just right in front of you, you weren't looking for it. You weren't going anywhere looking for it. But boom, there it is. It's just right in front of you. You know what to do? Don't lollygag. <laughs> Get out of there. Be serious. Be urgent. Take extreme measures. And so he fled. This is one of the best examples of overcoming temptation in all of Scripture, if not the best. Of course, Jesus resisting Satan in the wilderness. I, I, I don't think we'd put this over that one. So, but anyway, uh, a couple of things that I want to point out. First of all, we need to take sin seriously. Sometimes we, and when I say we, I mean myself. Sometimes all of us treat sin casually. It's not a big deal. You know, it's a stress reliever or whatever we think of it as. It's just no big deal. It's a big deal. It's sin. It is what separates us from God. Isaiah 59 and verses 1 and 2. Sin is what separates from us from God. We need to take sin so seriously that we will do literally anything to keep from sinning. Sometimes Christians just lack the passion and the desire and the drive to just kill it, to, to just destroy the sin and be done with it. They just kind of go on and... No, we've got to take extreme measures sometimes. Have you seen the movie Fireproof? Kurt Cameron, terrible acting. <laughs> terrible. But the point of the movie is, is great. And I think I even cried somewhere toward the end of the movie. So here's this man acted by Kurt Cameron. And he is struggling with, with porn, with internet porn. His marriage is a wreck. It, it, it's, it's just on the rocks. And uh, so he tries to win back his wife through this series of, of uh, what's called love dares. And anyway, he continues finding himself being tempted and drawn to the, to the computer to look at, at porn. And he finally gets to the point where he's done. He, have you ever heard, sick and tired of being sick and tired? He is sick and tired of being sick and tired. He's fed up with it. He's done with it. He has passion to get it out of his life. He takes the computer. He yanks it out of the wall. He takes it out in his yard. He throws it on the grass. He grabs a baseball bat. He beats that thing to pieces while his neighbor watches in horror. He was done with it. Until we reach that point where you can almost feel the emotion inside of you, I've got to do something about this, where you become almost physiologically upset. I've got to do something about this. Until you reach that point, you're not done with sin. And it's not done with you. And it's not done with me. Until we reach that point to get passionate, to go to extremes, well, I've got to have the Internet. That's not extreme. I've got to have the Internet for my job. That's not extreme. Maybe you need to find a new job where you don't have to have the Internet. It might be a choice of having your job or having heaven. Which one do you want to have, your job? Or do you want to have heaven? Be willing to pay the price. Would you be willing, now let's just think of some other examples. Would you be willing to leave the movie theater if you're there and something's on the screen that shouldn't be there? You paid for the movie. I can't leave. Yes, you can. You can leave. You can do it. I know my sister did that when I was young, and we left the movie theater. I was so embarrassed, but I was so glad that she set such a good example. Leave the party. Just leave. Well, I don't want to be rude. Be rude. I don't mean literally be rude, but just leave. How about breaking up with a boyfriend or girlfriend? That's quite a price to pay, isn't it? It's a hard price to pay. But if they are not going to become your friend and they continue to be an accomplice, then that might be what's necessary. How about divorcing your spouse? If you're in an 
in a marriage that you find out is unscriptural. It's an adulterous marriage. That would be quite a sacrifice. That would be very, very hard. I can't begin to fathom how hard that would be, and we need to sympathize with that. But that's just an example of paying an extreme price. How about give your life? How about dying, if that's what it takes? A man told me one time that he had to become a drunk because when he was in the war, uh, in World War II, that all they gave him to drink was beer. I don't really believe that, but that's what he said. We didn't have any water. We just had beer, so if we wanted to drink, we had to drink beer, so I became a drunk. I didn't have a choice. Well, I can, I can again, I can sympathize with that, but really, didn't he have a choice? Even if the choice was to drink nothing to the point of death, I want us to really think about this. Now, this is, I'm challenging me here big time uh, because my faith has not been tested this way, and it's easy for Preacher Adam to stand up here and say all these grandiose things, but we just need to be realistic with what Scripture says. Okay, look at Revelation chapter 2, please. Revelation chapter 2, and verse 10, this is the church at uh, Pergamum. Okay, church at Smyrna. So in verse 10, do not fear, this is Jesus, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. What does that mean, be faithful to the point of death? You know how that passage has traditionally been used? It's been traditionally used, traditionally it's been used to say, be faithful until you get old and die. And that's true. We do need to be faithful until we get old and die. Nobody's arguing with that, but that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying, be faithful to the point, to the extremity of even death. If death is what is required to overcome a sin, listen, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, so that you may be able to bear it. Will God make a way of escape every time that we're tempted? Yes. It may mean doing what Joseph did. That way of escape may mean, may mean you have to bodily flee the scene. It could mean the way of escape is dying. I'd hate for that to happen, but that could, that could be the case. Would we be willing to do that to avoid sin? And so we need to maybe physically but also symbolically do what Joseph did here, flee from sin. In 1 Corinthians 6, in verse 18, it says, flee immorality. And the context there is talking about sexual immorality. It's fleeing fornication. Every sin that a man commits is against his own body, but the man who commits fornication sins against his own body. And so, what is our response to fornication? It is, is it, well, let me just kind of get over here, just maybe a little bit on the other side of the fence. No, flee! That's the idea. And we could look at many other passages that make that point, but I've done that before in some other lessons. And so, we've seen that Joseph did three things to be successful in overcoming temptation with Potiphar's wife. He connected with his goals, number one. He avoided her presence as much as he possibly could. That's number two. And he took extreme measures. I don't think there's anything he wouldn't have done to avoid this sin. Yet Joseph's victory over the temptation wasn't simply a, a matter. I want us to realize it wasn't simply a matter of willpower. It wasn't, well, he just had so much willpower that he was able to overcome it. Sure, that came into play. But sometimes we get caught in the willpower trap. And we think, the only way for me to overcome temptation is I just have to be stronger. And, and then when we fail, we think, well, it's because I didn't have enough willpower. But what Joseph did is he implemented skills that he had developed. And so it's not just about willpower. It's about using the right skills. You know, if, if we're ever watching something at home and there is a lady that comes on the screen that's even 
close to being not modestly dressed. And we're careful with what we watch. But if we're watching something with the kids, a family movie or something, there's somebody that's dressed just in a way that's not completely appropriate. I, I am so proud of my boys. They immediately turn their head. And I do too. And we usually look straight at Holly to let us know when to look back at the movie. We just turn our head. And that's a skill. What I'm saying is after a while, you don't even think about it. That's just what you do. When the moment comes, what do you do? You look away. And it becomes a habit. So when we develop the right skills and add that to our willpower, then we have a lot more strength. Joseph's connecting with his goals and his avoiding her presence as much as possible. Even his fleeing were skills that he had developed, I'm sure, over the years. But ultimately, Joseph was not victorious because he had developed the right skills or had enough willpower or had the right strategy. Ultimately, Joseph was victorious because God was with him. And he was with God. We, like Joseph can overcome temptation as well. No matter how persistent it is, no matter how stubborn it is, no matter how in your face it is, why can we do that? Because God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The ultimate reason we can overcome is because God is faithful. So may we imitate the very wonderful example of Joseph, and lean upon God and draw our strength from Him to be able to overcome temptation. Would you bow your head with me in a word of prayer? Our Father, our God, we just praise Your name. We thank You for Your goodness and Your mercy. We need it. I need it because we're sinful. Help us to be careful. Help us to place ourselves in situations that will help to make us successful, to surround ourselves with people who will help us, Father, to overcome sin and to serve you faithfully. Help us, God, to connect with our goals in the moment of temptation, to avoid the very presence of temptation as much as we possibly can, and give us the strength and the passion to take extreme measures, to get rid of sin and to be done with it, and to take it very seriously. Give us strength, Father, as we continue trying to become more like your Son who never sinned. And thank you for the death that he died for us so that we can have forgiveness when we fail and we don't overcome sin and temptation. We praise your name. And through your Son's name we pray. Amen. Temptation is to see the tempter standing outside the back door of your heart. Sin is to unlock that door so that he may have his desire. Victory is to open wide the front door of your heart, inviting the Savior in to enter and give you strength to bar tight the back door. You need Jesus in your life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Without Christ, you can't do all things. You need His help. You need His strength. You need Him in your life. And if you're not a Christian, you can have Him in your life by responding to the gospel, by obeying the gospel, believing in Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing His name, and being baptized, and continuing to obey Him faithfully and trusting in His power and His strength and His grace to save you finally in the end. If you'd like to become a Christian, I can hear the baptistry right behind me. And the water's ready. If you are a Christian and you need our prayers, you've not been taking sin seriously, you need to repent. And it may mean that you need to come forward and make that known so that we can pray with you and we can see and know that, yes, indeed, you have repented. We urge you, if we can assist you now, please come to the front as we stand and sing the songs of invitation.